Longpo, we would like to invite you now to begin the retreat. And this will be followed by Brother Sun Xiang, formally requesting for the three refuges and the eight precepts. So we agree, we chat with the Itibiso. Is that what we start? So most of you will know this chant. Um, we'll just do the Pali, Itibiso Bhagava, and it's the reflection on the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. So please join me. Yeti piso bhagawa arahang samma samputo avicca charana sampano sugato loka vidu anuttaro apurisadamma sarati sata deva manu sana Bhuto Bhagavati Savakatoa Bhagavata Dhammoa Sande Tiko Akalipo Ehi Pasiko Opanaiko Pachatam Vedita Bovinyu Hiti Subhatipanoa Bhagavato Savakatoa Sangoa, would you party fan no apagapaso? Sawaka sango, ya ya party fan no apagawato, sawaka sango, sami chi party fan no apagawato, sawaka sango, ya didan chatari for his Kaniyata Purisa Pukkala Esa Bhagavato Asavaka Sangko Ahuneyo Ahuneyo Takineyo Anjali Karaniyo Anuttarang Punya Ketang Loka Sati so Bhagava Arahang Samba Sambo Vicha Charana Samba Noa Sugato Loka Vipu Anuttaro Apurisadam Masarati Sata Deva Manusanam Puto Bhagavati Sava Kato Bhagavata Dhammo Sande Tiko Akali Tore Ipasiko Opanayiko Pachatang Vedita Vinyu Hiti Subhatipano Abhagavato Savaka Sango Ujubhatipano Abhagavato Savaka Sango Anyaya Patipano Abhagavato Savaka Sango Asami Jipatipano Abhagavato Savaka Sango Yati Dhan Chattare Purisa Yuga Niyata Purisa Pukkala Esa Bhagavato Savaka Sango Ahuneyo Apahuneyo Atakinayo Anjali Karaniyo Anuttaram Punya Ketam Loka Sariti Piso Bhagava Aram Sampasambhuto Vichar 
ังปิดามังสารนังกัจฉามิทัติยังปิสังกังสารนังกัจฉามิทัติยังปิสังกังสารนังกัจฉามิทิสารนังกามนังนิติตังอามาบันเตพานาทิปาทาเวรมณีสิกาปดังสมาติยามีพานาทิปาทาเวรมณีสิกาปดังสมาติยามี I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. อาดีนาดาณเวรมณีสิกาปดังสมาติยามีอาดีนาดาณเวรมณีสิกาปดังสมาติยามี I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. ขาเมสุมิชาชาราเวรมณีสิกาปดังสมาติยามิขาเมสุมิชาชาราเวรมณีสิกาปดังสมาติยามิ I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. มูสาวาดาเวรมณีสิกาปดังสมาติยามีมูสาวาดาเวรมณีสิกาปดังสมาติยามี I undertake the precept to refrain from lying. I undertake the precept to refrain from lying. สุระเมรายมาจาปมาดธานาเวรมณีสิกาปดังสมาติยามีสุราเมรายามาจาพมาดธานาเวรมณีสิกาปดังสมาธิยามี I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. อิมานิปัญชาสิกาปตานิสีเลนสุขติญาติสีเลนบอกัสปตาสีเลนนิปุตติญาติตัสมาสีลังวิสุทัยเยสัตุสัตุสัตุ Let's bow together three times. First bow. Second bow, third bow. Thank you, Long Po. Right here we are. Is it my turn? The screen is mine. Well, very nice to be with you. I wish we could all kind of be together in a big retreat center, but here we are. This is good. This is good. So Joyce and JC have done a wonderful job of putting this together. They're, they're just so perfect, right? So much, much gratitude to Joyce and JC and whoever invented Zoom, right? We have much to be grateful for. Um, so we have uh, what four four days together. Um, four days, right? So, how how best to make use of this time? Because uh, it is it's very very special. Well, each of you will have a, a, a different schedule. You'll have different family commitments. So, first and foremost, make sure you're 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 kind to everyone. Like, don't tell your people shut up by meditating. You don't want to do that. Because you're going to have to go back and live with them. So <laughs> you, you want to negotiate some kind of a space where people understand that now is the time where you're not engaging with the um, responsibilities of your life. So the more you can 
craft that as a kind of lifestyle for these four days, then it, it sort of becomes a monastery, doesn't it? And what might be very helpful, obviously, the five precepts are always important, but um, as little distraction as possible. So I would say, um, give your give your iPhone to someone, <laughs> <laughs> which is uh, no one's going to do. I know, but j just think about. Um, if we're going to realize the peace of the mind and we're going to go to the deepest parts of, Bu of Buddhism, which are the transcendent teachings of the unconditioned, Nibbana, the deathless, the greatest hindrance to that is uh, preoccupation with objective experience, sights, sounds, smells, uh, Facebook and Facebook doesn't exist in a poly canon, but I think the Buddha would say, not a great idea. Because not that Facebook is, is wrong or immoral, it's just so seductive, isn't it? I mean, I don't even, I've never even seen Facebook, to be honest, but that's what they tell me. Uh, um, and all of, the, all of this sort of media, they can be very, very helpful. So I, as I say, I look at videos on furniture making they can be very helpful. so it's really not a moral issue it's more the issue that what prevents us from realizing that the peace that the buddha said was possible is we are preoccupied with objective experience right so if we never create some kind of space in our busy lives where we're not preoccupied with sights and sounds and responsibilities and so on we're not available for this piece that the Buddha said is possible. So I would ask you in these four days, if it's possible to do less, great. And then even a little less than that. Less, not more is very, very helpful. Very, very helpful. So if you, if in the middle of the retreat, you get some great idea of what you should do, don't do it. <laughs> That's called boredom. And boredom likes to get interested, right? Um, so, the like the way the monastery is set up we have boundaries we set up boundaries around which around food around media around work even because we can overwork because we're all hard workers so we have to put the tools down so can you create a lifestyle over these four days where the amount of distractions you have are lessened i don't know how you'll do that and what are the distractions that are available food uh, the internet television um sex drugs and rock and roll i suppose but for, no one's probably into that anymore <laughs> but you know i think you get the kind of feeling of it it's it's the mind always going outside now the thing about meditation is what we're doing is we're 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 learning to pay attention to things which are not exciting they're neutral and that's hard to do because your attention is drawn by excitement something you know you watch some uh, sport or some uh, piece of music or concert whatever whatever um, it's interesting that's why you can pay attention to it very very easily but as soon as the experience changes the event ends then you're left with what a restless mind which wants yet another interesting exciting experience so what we're doing in meditation is we're not picking up excitement we're like the breath is not exciting unless you're you know you're having an asthmatic attack normally the breath is just the breath it's very neutral uh, or we just maybe do a mantra or do some simple chanting or do body awareness none of this is exciting so what you have to do is you have to bring up the resources from your own mind because you are interested in actually learning how to focus learning how to calm learning how to compose the mind and and then you're, you're given a, a kind of exercise of meditation. And then you try to apply your attention to that. You see, it's difficult because your mind wants to think about something else or do something else. So especially in the first hours and days of retreat, there's a, it's oftentimes not very pleasant. Especially if you're giving up some of your distractions. Because the habit that we have is when we feel restless we go to some distraction or we fall asleep 
now you're, 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 you're putting away your distractions. And any of you who've done long retreats and retreat centers know that like the first few days you can feel restless or bored or have a feeling you're not getting anywhere or want to do something else. These are important things to be aware of because they're just symptoms of restlessness. The mind wanting to go outside into sense experience. Again, this isn't the moral issue. This is an issue more of, of spiritual calm and, and centeredness and, and quietness of mind. So whatever comes up in these days of retreat, don't expect it to be interesting or peaceful or exciting. If it is, great, but it probably won't be. <laughs> because what will happen, of course, you'll be facing a mind which is used to doing things if you've lived a busy life, right? And all of a sudden that is taken away from you. You might feel calm in the beginning, but very often, you know, you're looking at the clock and you want to do something and want to do something else, so you fall asleep. And that's the challenge of the craft of meditation. You're challenged now, not by, by, by looking at the mind and understanding how you can compose and calm the mind. Right? So whatever comes up, it is the meditation. If you feel sleepy, that is the meditation. If you feel restless, that is the meditation. If you don't want to meditate, that is the meditation. If you want to meditate, that is the meditation. If you feel like you're enlightened, that is the meditation. If you feel like you'll never get enlightened, that is the meditation. You get the picture, right? Whatever, it's an object. It's a thought. It's an emotion. That's all it is. It's a perception. It's a feeling. It comes and it goes. It comes and it goes. But the awareness, the awareness does not come and go. Knowing is the gateway to that transcendent peace which the Buddha offers us. So if you are think, you know, if you if you if you perceive meditation as being a really this kind of really neat peaceful experience, or you feel loving kindness to everyone, good luck, because <laughs> usually it doesn't work that way. You know, you you, uh, you oftentimes you don't feel that. You know, you feel annoyed at your kids for making too much noise or, or you would have difficulty slaying asleep and so on. So expectations of quality of meditation can really get you in a bind because you want something. Maybe you had a, a good experience last time and you hope to have that same experience this time. And that expectation, you have to know that as an object because expectation is a type of mindset. And if you're not aware of it, you will then start to judge your retreat or your meditation from that expectation. This isn't what this isn't what I wanted. This isn't what I'm seeking. I want something else. And if you're not aware of that, then it'll never work. Right? So let's get to just kind of try to let go of any expectations, any attainments, any kind of becomings, and say, I'm just going to work with whatever comes up during these four days. Right? If I feel happy, great. If I don't feel happy, if I get if I get it cold or 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 whatever. I'm just going to be with the way things are. So that's intention. Intention is really the, the energy of the practice, isn't it? You know, you make an intention, you fulfill it, and then you start to see what results you get. Now in terms of, of, of meditation techniques, there's a million and one techniques, or maybe a million and two. There's many ways to meditate. And if something works for you, and I say something that doesn't work for you, then use what works for you. Don't, you know, don't, you can, you can ask for your money back from Joyce or something, but that's not going to be a problem. So sometimes when a teacher gives instruction, you, it doesn't fit for you. That's just fine. We're all, you know, we're, we're all different, different beings, but try it out, you know, try out, you know, my suggestions, see if they work. If they don't work, just know, okay, this guy, you know, whatever he says doesn't quite work for me, which is great, no, no problem. So you're just trying this out. And, and a lot of the, a lot of the, like most of us who have listened to Dharma for some time in our lives, you know, like I'll go back, we'll, we'll listen to a talk and we won't quite get it. And then we'll go back to the talk five years later and say, I get it. So quite often you, you pick something up intuitively inside yourself. You're not quite sure what it is, but it processes through you. It processes in one day you, you kind of, oh, I get it. And that's insight. Now, how does insight work? To be honest, I don't know. 
but there is something about the human mind which is insightful you just you just get it and like like the joke like the punchline of a joke you kind of get it and so i was thinking of analogy how insight sometimes works it's like you imagine you're walking down um uh, a busy what's that busy street in singapore orchard road or something where all the horse stores are okay you're walking on orchard road with all these gucci stores and all this kind of gear they sell and the big plate windows uh, which reflect your image back and you're walking and then all of a sudden you can't like let's say i'm i'm an old man and gravity is winning i'm starting to go more to the floor than to the sky so i've got a terrible posture so i'm always oh come on we're gonna pick it up and so let's say i'm walking along orchard street and i go by a window and i just notice myself slouched over i say oh wow i didn't know that was going on and i pick myself up and that's how insight works you know, you, 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 you kind of don't, under, you don't understand something and then all of a sudden, I get it. And how does that happen? That happens through a mind which is reflecting rather than just has a, a kind of technique where you're trying to bludgeon yourself into enlightenment or force yourself into enlightenment. So in the different ways that one hears about meditation, I think one of the ways that many of us started and I fell away from but I started like that is the idea I had was, okay, I've got to concentrate on some meditation object, my nimitta, my breath, and I've got to uh, basically suppress everything else. I've just got to zero in on this thing and make sure there's no thought and no other sense experience. And if I zero in on this and I get really, really concentrated, then somehow there'll be enlightenment. I don't know, that was the one I started with. I don't know if you started with that. And it seemed quite, you know, yeah, sure, I'll just. But what happened to me was that it, even if I could hold my mind on an object to make it tranquil, as soon as I let go of the object, I became just as confused, just as confused, even more, I think. So just holding on to something and, and suppressing everything else will certainly calm your mind but it won't liberate your mind because you're still dependent on some object. So the way, some object of attention. And the way Ajahn Chah described that, he said, it's like you have a, you've probably heard this analogy, but like if you have a rock and you put it on the grass and, and, and then the, the grass doesn't grow under the rock, as soon as you take the rock away, the grass will start to grow again. And that's a meditation which is, Oh, I think overly, overly concentrated and just trying to erase everything. Having said that, you still need to learn how to compose the mind. You need how to, you know, we need to know how to collect the mind and bring it to the moment. But that's not through suppression of other things. It's more through awareness of, of disturbance and not following the disturbance. Awareness of dullness not following the dullness and that's a reflective capacity so when you're meditating you're also noticing like how do i feel when i begin like am i am i tired today am i bored am i just doing this out of a sense of duty what is what is the mood of the mind and what's the atmosphere like is it really really hot so it makes me sluggish um did i have a, uh, an argument with someone in the morning so i have that material coming up how is it? So taking stock. And that's really important because what people do is they have a technique and they just kind of go for the technique, but they're not necessarily um, noticing what the mood of the mind is. So you, you, you want to, first of all and foremost, you want to awaken to what's going on. I mean, that is so ordinary and yet it is extraordinary because quite often we are not awake and aware to the way things are we're just running on automatic pilot or reacting so when we take refuge in buddha what we're doing is we're 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 remembering to be awake awake present fully conscious to what's going on now that's not a demand that what is going on is nice or pleasant no you can feel very, very um, irritated by something, but you can be awake to that, right? I can feel annoyed or disappointed or, or frightened or hungry or thirsty. I can be awake to that. So notice that 
the awake mind or awareness is, is not a quality. It knows qualities. Yeah. And that's different. Think about that. You can, I can feel both hot and cold, but the awareness is not hot and the awareness is not cold. It just knows. And this is what you want to train in first and foremost is the awake mind. There's not a technique. It's a remembering. We can all do it. We're doing it all the time. Otherwise, we'd be in trouble. And we're now we're doing it very formally. So you begin the meditation with that. So Buddhang Saranangachami, what does that mean? It means awake and aware to the way things are. So if I'm feeling... Um, let's say that maybe tomorrow they're, they're clearing the land and the chainsaws are running and I'm feeling distracted uh, and I'm feeling annoyed. I'm doing, you know, I'm thinking we're well, doing this retreat. Can't you guys be quiet? Now, when I know annoyance as annoyance, annoyance feels this way. Oh, I know. I recognize annoyance. That's taking refuge in Buddha. When I believe in annoyance and I, and I, and I say, why don't you guys shut up? Why don't, you, why don't you stop doing that? I've been reborn in annoyance. That's taking refuge in annoyance. You see the difference. It's still the same mood, but one is witnessing, the other is attaching. And that's what we mean by attachment. So that's the first step. Awakening to the way things are. Not a quality, but a, an attitude. Or an attitude. Then... You know, having kind of taken stock, I'm here now, this is what it feels like. Then you have to make an intention, intention to meditate. That sounds very ordinary, but sometimes old time meditators just kind of get into the habit. They sit down and they sort of do their thing. And that can be skillful, but sometimes it's not so skillful. So you make a clear statement to yourself. Um, during this time, I'm going to be present, aware, conscious of all sensations, all feelings, all images that come into my body mind. That if you make that kind of statement to yourself a couple of times, you're setting yourself up for what you're doing. And then you say, if any other issues come up, I'll set them aside until after the meditation. Okay? So you make that very clear statement to yourself about what you're doing. So that if 10 minutes through the meditation, you get a bright idea of what you're going to do next week. You say, no, that's not my intention. Put it aside. And you have to put these things aside a lot because the mind does get bored. It doesn't know how to stay with the object of meditation. And it creates beautiful or interesting or annoying things that you get attracted to. Clever ideas uh, or, or old memories come up. All you say is later, just later. And you keep making that intention. So you start to, to build a foundation for presence, awareness, awake, the intention to be with the meditation that you're doing. And you keep reiterating that intention. You keep saying, no, this is what I'm doing. You're kind of, you make a commitment to the object of meditation and to the, you know, the thing you're doing. Now, this isn't like forcing yourself. It's just a commitment. That's all it is. For this period of time, no, this is what I'm doing. So if your mind wants to wander, you know that. We say, no, my commitment's here. So it's not like a, a, it's not like a violent, no, I have to meditate. No, no, this is my preference. I want to do this now. I want to explore the mind through this meditation technique. So having made the intention, then you try the exercise that you're given. You try that out. And then it's important to reflect as well, because you can, you can just kind of force yourself to try to be peaceful by using the technique, but that won't work because you need intelligence. And intelligence is the capacity to see cause and effect. What are the causes for me calming the mind in this situation? And what's actually happening? Am I getting more restless? Is my body getting uptight? What's, how does it work? And is it working for me well? So once you start to do that and you see cause and effect, one of the things you'll notice is that even though your meditation might have been difficult, you might have felt restless or sleepy, but you kept, you kept trying to awaken to the dullness or the uh, annoyance or whatever. You kept trying to be awake to it. You might actually 
think that the meditation wasn't very, very good, but at the end of it, you'll be much stronger and much more aware and much more peaceful. So the quality of meditation doesn't necessarily determine how peaceful you are coming out of it. Because the quality of the meditation might be the fact that you were able to witness restlessness. You watched it, you didn't attach. You watched it, you didn't attach. And you wore it out. And that's called purification. So some of the peace comes because you were willing to be with something which is not peaceful. And you didn't run away from it. You didn't distract it. This is very true with like media. Um, like if you put your iPhone next to your meditation cushion, that's a disaster. <laughs> if you really think that you're not going to, you know, it's better to put your iPhone somewhere in the attic. <laughs> but, let, but let's say <laughs> you uh, you want to you want to challenge yourself. Okay, so you're crazy enough to put the iPhone next to your meditation cushion and you want, you observe if you're into iPhones, I don't have one, but if, if you're into iPhones, you watch how difficult it is not to look at it, especially when you're bored, right? So you make a determination. Now I'm going to just watch my breath and <laughs> well, what's going on out there in the world. So the more you can put that stuff away, uh, you still want to do something else because you've been busy and so on, but you're saying, oh, this is the feeling of not wanting to be here. You awaken to that. This is the feeling of wanting to do something else. You awaken to that. Uh, this is a feeling of feeling bored. You awaken to that. So what you're emphasizing is awareness rather than the objects of awareness. You see the difference. So whatever you're experiencing, you can be aware of that. The thing is, it's not necessarily pleasant or fun. Huh? And, 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 but your commitment now is to awareness rather than to the quality of the experience. It's to the attitude of awareness rather than the quality of the experience. This is very important, okay? Yeah, so, so those are just a few ideas. Um, why don't we take, you know, stretch your legs a bit and we'll get into some meditation. So just some, uh, a few words on posture. If you're, maybe tomorrow I'll talk about lying down meditation, but for now, um, in sitting meditation, you wanna make sure that your chin is just slightly lower than your forehead. If your chin is up, you tend to think more. Um, you want to, uh, uh, a posture where your knees are lower than your hips. If your knees are higher than your hips, you're gonna put a lot of pressure on the small of your back. That's why people use zafus and cushions. If you're using a chair, like a soft sofa or something, you're sitting back in the sofa, it's gonna be very difficult to meditate. So it's better to sit on the edge of the chair and that your legs, your knees are just slightly lower than your hips. This helps a lot with uh, lower back pain. So be careful of that. Um, then in terms of the posture, you can sit cross-legged, you can um, sit with on, on a chair with your feet to the ground. The thing, I guess the most important thing is just look really, really solid, that you don't have to fidget. Comfortable, but solid, so you don't have to move, because stillness of the body is very helpful in meditation. So when you, when you take the posture, if your chest is open, hmm, and, and your, your, your knees are lower than your hips, your hara is open, your chest is open, you get a lot of breath, right? It's very open. Um, and then if you, you can hold your hands together on your uh, one hand on the other or on your knees, but something where your chest is nice and open, so they're really able to breathe and that, you're, and that your belly isn't cramped in the posture. Um, then usually like people prefer um, sitting with their eyes closed, uh, but it's not, it's the main thing about the eyes closed is when you close the eyes, you think more. 
But when you open your eyes, you're more distracted by visual things. So you have to choose yourself. Obviously, if you're really sleepy, the big thing is to try to keep your eyes open, which is actually very difficult, but that is the usual recommendation. Um, so during this meditation, once, once you've established your posture, then reconfigure it just 10% more and get really comfortable and then make a determination to be still, not rigid, but not to move, not to fidget, not to itch, not to scratch, not to shift all the time. Because you make all of that part of your meditation. If you want to scratch yourself, don't, but make that part of awareness. If you want to shift your posture, don't, but make that part of your awareness. Now, obviously, if you have pain, then move out of it. I'm not recommending you hurt yourself, but don't buy into the, the fidgetiness of posture. You'll never get the posture perfect, by the way. So give up. Just, it's good enough kind of thing, right? So I'll set the clock for, let's say, 45 minutes. And I'll give lots of instruction. And we'll just see where we go with this. All right. Here we go. So close your eyes and, and take a good solid posture. So if you're on a chair, feel your feet really flat on the ground. Feel your hara or your belly nice and open. And the chin slightly tucked in. Balanced, solid. And now determine stillness. Not rigid, just don't buy into the desire to move and shift your posture. So the wanting to move becomes part of the meditation. Wanting to scratch or itch. So contemplate stillness of body. Relax into stillness of body. Now I'll go through various parts of the body. You use my voice as your voice and feel the sensations in the various parts that I describe. And what you're doing is you're just feeling the tactile sensation, the warmth or coolness or vibration of that part of the body and then move on to the next. Now, I'm not asking you to visualize the part of the body, neither to think about it. So it's a very physical awareness of sensation. So bring attention to your mouth. Feel the inside of the mouth. Feel the floor of the mouth. Feel the sensations in the floor of the mouth. Vibrations radiating outwards in the floor of the mouth. Feel the roof of the mouth, physical sensations, vibrations radiating from the roof of the mouth. Inside the cheeks, the left side, feel the sensations in the left side of the cheek inside the mouth. Feel the right side inside the cheek, vibration, sensations. Feel the lower jaw, sensations coming into consciousness. Feel the lower lip, let that become alive with sensation. the lower teeth, the lower gums. Feel the upper jaw alive with sensation. Feel the upper lip 
Let sensations come into consciousness. Feel the upper teeth and the upper gums. Now take that whole area as one ball of energy, radiating energy, the whole mouth, vibration, sensations. Let that become conscious. Follow line inside the body, inside the head, up into the ear canals. Feel the ear canals as vibration, as sensation. Feel both ear canals, hollow tubes of vibration and sensation. Let them become conscious. And then move outwards into the outer structures of the ears. Feel the folds of the ears, the top of the ear, sensations vibrating. Feel both ears. Bring those together, feel the mouth. Sensations, vibrations, radiating, and the ears. Feel those together as one unit of energy, vibrating sensations, mouth and ears. Bring attention to the sensations of the nose. Now you're not looking you're not trying to visualize the nose. So relax your eyes. And it's not a concept, so relax your brain. It's just the physical sensation. So the bridge of the nose, the sensations at the bridge of the nose. And at the nostrils, the air creating coolness or warmth at the nostrils. And feel the whole nose as a ball of vibration and sensation. Feel the mouth, the ears and the nose as one area of vibration and sensation. Allow it to become conscious. Feel the sensations in the eyes, the eyebrows, the eye sockets, the hollows of the eye sockets. The eyes themselves vibrating with tensions or sensations. Feel the eyes, both eyes. Now bring all those together, the mouth, ears, nose, and eyes. One conglomerate of energy, vibration, not a concept. Draw a line behind the eyes into the center of the brain. Feel the center of the brain, sensations in the center of the brain. Behind the forehead, feel the sensations at the forehead. Allow them to become conscious, vibrating, radiating. Draw a line back from the forehead to the center of the brain. Feel the center of the brain, sensations at the center of the brain. Feel under the scalp, the top of the head, 
the sensations under the scalp, vibrations, sensations, let them become conscious. Draw a line from the scalp down to the center of the brain, feel the center of the brain. And the back of the head, feel the sensations at the back of the head, vibrations radiating in all directions. Take a line from the back of the head to the center of the brain, feel the center of the brain radiating energy, sensations, And then bring all that together. Feel the mouth radiating energy sensations, the ears, the nose, the eyes, the forehead, top of the head, back of the head, center of the brain. Feel that all is like one unit, one ball of vibrations and sensations in awareness. So the head, not as an idea, but as the physical experience in awareness. Bring your attention down through the head to the neck. Feel the back of the neck. Feel the throat. Feel the sensations in the neck, vibrating, pulsating in all directions. Feel the connection of the neck to the left shoulder, where it meets the left shoulder. Feel the sensations there, vibrations. Let that become conscious. Feel the left upper arm. Sensations, warmth, vibration. Feel the left elbow. Feel the sensations radiating in all directions. Feel the left forearm. The left wrist and the left, the back of the left hand. The thumb. the index finger, the middle finger, the ring finger, the little finger. Feel the palm of the left hand. Feel the whole left hand as sensation, vibration radiating outwards. Feel the left hand, the left wrist, the left forearm, the left elbow, the left upper arm, the left shoulder, the left side of the neck. Feel that all as one unit, one pulsating unit of energy. Feel the right side of the neck connecting to the right shoulder. Feel the right shoulder, vibrations, sensations. Down, feel the right forearm, the warmth against the body, the right elbow, sensations, uh, the right forearm, the right wrist, back of the right hand, vibrating sensations, the right thumb, the right index finger, the right middle finger, the right ring finger, and the little finger. The right palm, feel the whole right hand as one ball of energy, sensation. Feel the right wrist, right forearm, right elbow, 
right upper arm, right shoulder. Feel that whole unit as one energy sensation. Now put all that together. Feel the mouth. I feel the ears. I feel the nose. Vibrations. Feel the eyes. The sensations in the forehead. The sensations in the top of the head. The back of the head. In the middle of the brain. Bring all those together with the feelings in the neck. And the feelings in both shoulders and both arms and both hands. All is one unit. Vibrating sensations in awareness. This is the body in awareness. Bring your attention to the hollow in your throat. Feel the hollow in your throat. Go into the inside of your chest. Feel the front inside of the chest. Vibration sensation. Feel the left inside of your chest. Pressures, vibrations. Feel the right inside of your chest. Feel the back inside of your chest. Feel the lungs. Feel the heart. Feel the diaphragm, all the organs inside the chest. Feel that all as one unit. Vibrating sensations in all directions. Feel the belly of the abdomen. Go inside the abdom abdominal area. Feel the left side inside of the abdomen. I feel the right side of the inside of the abdomen. I feel the back of the inside of the abdomen and the front. And then the organs, the lower and upper intestine below, kidneys at the back, liver on the right, heart, all the organs in that area. So feel that as like one unit, a one ball of energy vibrating. Feel the pelvic area, feel the pelvic bones, pressures, vibrations, sensations inside the pelvic area, inside the right pelvis, inside the left pelvis, the back of the pelvis area, base of the pelvis, the front, the reproductive organs, the colon, the urinary muscles, the rectum, that whole area. Allow that to be conscious as sensation or vibration. Feel the pelvis. The whole torso then, from the base of the pelvis all the way up to the top of the lungs. Feel that as one vibrating unit sensations, vibrations, in awareness. This is the body in awareness. And then the torso, bring that with the head, feel the whole head, feel the both arms, shoulders, and feel the torso all as one unit. Vibration, sensation, in awareness. Feel the left hip, The vibration, the pressure on the, on the ground, left hip, the left thigh, the sensations in the left thigh, and the left knee, feel the left knee. Lower leg, feel the left lower leg, feel the left ankle, and the left foot, vibration. And then that whole area, 
foot, ankle, lower leg, knee, upper leg as one unit on the left side with the hip vibrating sensations. Feel the right leg, feel the right hip and the thigh and the right knee, the sensations in the right knee, make that conscious. Lower leg on the right side and the right ankle and the right foot. And that all bring that all together. Foot, ankle, lower leg, knee, thigh. And then both legs. Feel both legs as vibration, sensation. Now bring that all together. You have the head. Feel the whole head, mouth, ears, nose, eyes, forehead, top of the head, back of the head, inside the brain. Feel the whole head, neck, bring that together, the shoulders, arms and hands, the torso, from the lungs to the pelvis, and both legs down to the feet. So feel the whole body now is just one mass of vibrations and sensations in awareness. This is in awareness. Now notice sound, notice sound as in awareness. Notice the changing nature of sound, whatever the sound is, in awareness. And notice the body, not as a concept, but as an object in awareness. So vibrating, radiating sensations. And notice that it, the awareness doesn't change. Awareness knows sound, awareness knows body. So be that awareness. Be that awareness. And one way to do that is to bring up the thought that I am into the mind. So say to yourself, I am. And then bring that thought down through the throat, feel the throat, down into the chest. So feel your chest, I am. And then let go of am. And just say I at the chest, at the center of the chest, at the heart, I. And then drop the I and just be that awareness, knowing change. So I'll, I'll leave that instruction there for you and we'll sit for another 20 minutes and see what you want to do with that, if it's helpful or not.
if you have a chance during these four days to stretch out a period of meditation by changing posture, then that's very uh, profitable, informative. So those of you who've done in, in-person retreats know the schedule, like in the afternoon is usually maybe uh, 45 minutes of sitting, 45 minutes of walking, 45 minutes of sitting, 45 minutes of walking, that kind of pattern. And um, if you can set up an afternoon like that or a morning and learn how to meditate in several postures, then you, you build up the, the skills of, of, of awareness and meditation just by doing it like any craft. And that's a very good thing. So whatever pattern you want to uh, design for yourself, I would certainly recommend that. So then in changing postures, um, like say here here in the monastery, we have an evening puja uh, ending about, about now, I suppose, yeah, sort of. And then most of the monks go back to their kutis and they do walking meditation and maybe a bit more sitting. So we get, we get a stretch of like three, three hours in the evening. Of course, that's our business. We are monks, so we're supposed to be doing that. Um, or if we have a, a one pra, a, a uh, post a day, well, most of the monks will do an afternoon of practice and an evening. And now those, those, those really add up in a way that sh which aren't so evident when you're, when you're doing it. Quite often it doesn't seem like much. You're kind of doing your duty as a monk, sitting and walking, but it certainly adds up to a much more um, stronger sense of presence, uh, a stronger sense of the thinking mind. To be aware of the thinking mind is obviously terribly important because the thinking mind is symptomatic of the moods of the mind. So if you're worried about something or you're um, resentful about something, the storylines and narratives of thought are driven by the mood. That's obvious. And if you don't pay attention to the thoughts and you just run with them, well, then you're a victim. Plus, you, 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 you also exacerbate that habit and make it stronger. So there's a price to be paid for heedlessness. So if, I'm, if I tend to be a kind of worrying type and then I pick up some, something in my life and I worry about it, um, that is going to mean that the next time something happens, I'm going to have a, a tendency to worry more. So there's no, there's no kind of free lunch in this. The more you worry, the more you worry. Um, so awakening to thought is the first step, I think, to, to, to sort of diagnosing kind of what's going on underneath the thinking mind. What, what is the mood of the mind? And Ajahn Shah would really stress that a lot for us. The, the uh, Salt Arom, I think, in Thai. Uh, know the mood of the mind. Um, and a mood of, 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 of inspiration is different than a mood of, of disappointment, right? It's very different. So getting behind the thoughts is, is, is kind of like the Mahasi trick technique where they label, you know, you label a mood. So you're thinking about tomorrow, you just say planning. And you just put a label on it and then you watch what comes up, but like a habit of planning. You say, well, there it is, that's planning. And you establish awareness on that habit of mind. It comes up, you know it, it comes up, you know it. But you, you don't engage, you try not to engage, you don't try to get rid of it. You know it as an object, then it tends to cease. If you try to get rid of it, it won't. So if you indulge in it, it won't. So labeling is very good, the mood of the mind. Some people, if they're real doctors, then they'll say, well, what mood is it? It doesn't really matter, but just like putting a label on it, worry, uh, planning, create, creating whatever it is. Then you're stepping be behind the, uh, the thoughts, kind of getting deeper into the mind. So when you're doing, say, walking meditation, my might as well just describe that. I think most of you probably know, but uh, in the monastery, each of our meditation huts has a, a meditation path. And the monks built me a new one last year. So I have a 30-pace a meditation path, which for a monk is like a Rolls Royce. This is a really lovely wooden. I don't think I'd want a Rolls Royce, but a, a nice walking path is very, very, very special. 
and and so you you try to establish a, a distance in your home in a uh, in a corridor or diagonally across a big room or if you've got a back garden somewhere and you you establish that the, that walking path as your formal posture. So just as in meditation, you take a posture of cross-legged or sitting in a chair, that becomes your posture and you stay there, don't you? You stay in that posture and you watch your mind. Well, in the same way, you establish your meditation path, say it's 15 paces, you mark the ends, that's your posture, walking between that rather than kind of looking around or doing something else you have a kind of discipline around it and so the idea is to keep your eyes uh kind of lowered in front of you a couple of meters and and not to look around just to keep kind of focused just as you keep your eyes closed uh in in a sitting posture in the same way you you keep your focus narrow and uh, then you walk back and forth and people they say what am i supposed to be doing because it doesn't seem very productive you're just walking back and forth what you're what you're doing obviously is awakening to what's going on inside your mind and all the creations of self that go on and and learning not to not to um not to believe in them not to believe in the thinking mind to see thinking mind as an object not to believe in the fears not to believe in the resentment see well they're just objects they're coming and going so seeing thought as an object is quite a advanced state of human consciousness i think because most people either like just believe in their thoughts and follow their thoughts so the way one way to do that is if you're doing walking meditation after 15 paces what's going to happen is even if you're thinking your thought pattern is interrupted by the end of the path right and then what will happen is that the thought will stop even if it's only briefly and what you want to do is appreciate the end of thought recognize the end of thought recognize the gap uh when thought has stopped and that will happen at the end of the minute if you note it if you don't note it you just can do circles and like running around a merry-go-round um, so use the end of the path as a way of establishing mindfulness and then turn around mindfully and then start mindfully okay now my intention is to walk mindfully from a to b now this isn't control you're not trying to control yourself to not think because that's horrible you hate it then but you're just making attention to awaken to what's going on in your world within the containment of the paces in this case so you can see that if you if you if you do that for 45 minutes it's not interesting okay but it can be very very interesting in some ways in the sense you understand how you know what your mind is churning out so you want to be interested in what's going on in your mind not just trying to get rid of it and and just pat you know because that's one of the problems we have we just try to get rid of thought that won't work you want to be interested in it. what is it what is the thinking mind producing where is it coming from and then you observe and then at the end of the 15 paces each time if you recognize that you're breaking up the pattern of thinking being and that helps you to see thought as an object which helps to be more peaceful you turn around mindfully stop no thought so start to bring the mind to no thought each time you begin walking no thought feels like this just listen listen to sound and then start walking and the mind will, will start churning stuff up get to the end stop no thought end of thought just listen so use listening turn around mindfully stop 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 you, you're breaking it all up and and if you do that for a period of time half an hour 45 minutes you have a momentum in your practice of knowing thought as an object rather than being the thinking subject all the time and how much suffering is there in thinking subject right than the way we just run with thoughts so it's a very simple technique but it, it gives very good results then if you alternate walking sitting walking sitting do that for a while you can see how you build up a momentum of mindfulness which leads to more insight and more peace um now for like for monks because we use the meditation path a lot it becomes one of our best friends it really does you see your meditation path oh there's my old friend and the alms bowl is our old friend too that's important guy <laughs> very important 
But if you, if you, if even like your meditation cushion where you sit, your shrine, right? It becomes associated and imbued with, with goodness, with aspiration. So, so having like a, a rate, like these Zoom meetings we do, we always have the same shrine. We had some beautiful flowers donated the other day. A, a friend's father died. Beautiful, beautiful flowers. And we try to make it beautiful. And so a shrine is lovely. And then your, your own meditation path that you, you tend to go to all the time, your own kind of space where you, you meditate, your own cushion and so on. Not to be possessive, but just, oh yeah, this reminds me, a shrine reminds you of this aspiration you have. Um, lighting candles reminds you of your aspiration or putting flowers on the shrine. Having all that beautiful ritual is, is very helpful. I find it very helpful. Uh, in, in establishing the mind in this aspiration. Because meditation is not easy. You know, it's very hard to train the mind. The mind's very kind of uh, rebellious and, and things like that. So may I also, just before closing, just talk about lying down meditation. And you know, those of you who have hang, been hanging out with me in Zoom have heard me talk about it, but it's a, it's a, it's a really good posture to develop um, because you don't have to hold the body up. It's, of course, hard to do it because people fall asleep. Huh? So let me just sort of describe it for you. So you lay down in Sarvasana, or the corpse posture, and so your, your, your legs, you're, you're flat on the ground in a, in a soft enough mattress that it's not painful on your body. Usually it doesn't work well on your bed because your bed has so many associations of, of sleep. So get some kind of cushions down so that you're not like, it's too hard, it's just too hard for bones. Then uh, your legs should be about hip width apart and your arms are, are laid out away from your body like in Sarvasana, corpse posture and yoga. And then it's very important to get the knees a bit up because if your knees are, are too flat, that can put pressure on your knees plus on the small of your back. So put a, a good, good sized pillow under your knees and that will help the small of your back. And then your head, again, you don't, you don't want the chin higher than the forehead. You want the chin tucked in. Uh, so get your pillow set up. Lay down in Sarvasana, do that. And, and again, set up your posture and then correct it maybe another 10% just once, just once. And then when you've corrected it 10%, then the same uh, recommendation is be still, don't move, All right? Um, obviously you can move if you want, but try to make stillness as a part of the meditation. And what you'll find is you'll, you want to scratch, you want to move your shoulder a bit, you want to move your hip a bit, don't buy into that. Just use that very desire to move as an object in awareness. Let the desire to move deep in your awareness. And it's very interesting because the body's restlessness becomes, by not moving, you use the restlessness to calm the mind because each time you want to move, you notice you want to move. Most people really want to get over on their side and finish off the meditation with a good snooze. With that, you do it later, not, not, not quite during the meditation. Um, so uh, then what to do? So you set up the posture, make the determination not to move. Do the body, this, this body awareness. Go through the body like that, feeling all the parts of the body. And when you get really good at that, you can, you can just do it briefly and you just have whole body awareness, the body in awareness lying there. So the stillness and whole body awareness is sufficient. You don't have to do any more than that and just be with it and see what happens. Now, because you don't have to hold the body up, you can see quite often you've got tension, like trying to hold the body up. You don't have to do that. You can relax. Uh, so it's a posture that people feel frustrated with because they fall asleep. Um, but that's okay too. If you need to sleep, you need to sleep, fine. So don't use it as a posture to go to sleep. Like if you're really, really tired and you use this posture, then you kind of spoil the posture. They'll always associate it with falling asleep. So use it when you have most energy. Like use it when you've got the most energy and just experiment with it. 
or have a cup of coffee. This is allowed, fortunately. One of the great things that the Buddha allowed us is coffee <laughs> or tea. So get, you know, get some energy going, fine. And then lay down, we've got energy. And then see if you can not move. Just that little bit, not a little bit. And a lot of people find that hard. Now, what about falling asleep? Well, if you do, you do. Uh, but at some point, you're going to wake up. Then go back to stillness. Maybe you have to go to the toilet. I don't know. <laughs> but then go back to stillness. So, so um, like, especially for people who have insomnia, they can't get to sleep, and they kind of toss and turn and toss and turn. Take sarasana. Try it. Just try that as a meditation. And if you want to roll over your side, you can. Now, sometimes in this in this meditation, if you're letting go of thoughts and your mind's becoming quite empty of thinking, especially I thinking, if you're letting go of me and my thinking, I thinking and all of that, you'll find that, that, that the body starts to release energy. You know, you'll find that your arm will, will, will jump or your leg will jump. And that, and that arises from a kind of electrical impulse, I suppose. It feels like an itch. It comes up maybe in your thigh or maybe in a shoulder. It just comes up like something you want to scratch. You don't scratch it. And everything in, in you will want to scratch it. Don't scratch it. Just stay still. And then bang, it will release. They're very interesting. So quite often you, you know, sometimes you go through like 10, 15 minutes. That that takes you deeper into this practice. Um, then sometimes what's interesting is is actually you hear yourself starting to snore, right? Which is quite fun because what happens when you start to you get a shift in breathing to something more relaxed. Sometimes you just feel the shift, and it, it's a kind of that's what the way we often talk about meditation. We talk about it dropping. You hear that a lot. And the meditation drops into a kind of more quiet place. And this is quite often uh, when you start to snore. But the thing about snoring is it usually wakes you up. Your own snoring. So, you, you know, you hear this, this snort was me. Uh, but, but if you're just attentive, don't do anything, you find that your mind's actually uh, kind of dipped into a deeper place of silence. So I would, I would, recommend you try this posture because I've, I've found that people are it takes a while but once they get into it then they got then they've got three postures um, unless you do qigong then you have four uh, or, or 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 standing so you have like you can alternate sitting and lying if you don't have much place to do walking meditation sitting and lying sitting and lying um if you have our, our you know issues of arthritis or 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 you know have problems with your back I know several people thought they could meditate when I spoke to them about lying and they, oh yeah, I can do this. So I would recommend you try that, try this during during the retreat. But like all new things, it takes a while to figure it out. So you have to kind of invest some time into it. For those of you in, in Southeast Asia, uh, this is your morning, right? So you have a you have a day ahead of you. For us here in, in North America, uh, we are in moving towards the bed. Um, so if you have a whole day ahead of you, see if you can set up your intentions to create a, a contemplative meditative day. Like in your reading, see if you cannot read things which are disturbing, like about Afghanistan or, or COVID or global warming or who got robbed next door to you or, you know, it goes on. Because that's actually quite negative. Read enough of that, and you just feel negative. So if you need to read, you know, read, read something that's uplifting. Um, in terms of if you get tempted to watch videos, look at videos of saints. <laughs> or, or listen to bhajans, which inspire your heart. Yeah? If, you need, if you need audio stuff, don't listen to The Grateful Dead or, <laughs> or whatever you, whatever heavy metal or hip hop or those things disturb the mind, but like, you know, something we're going in chanting or, or the mantra that we heard as we came into this meeting that they play in Bodh Gaya, use that kind of media. So your mind is uplifted visually, like use pictures of saints or uh, of your mom or <laughs> whatever you want. So that the imagery that's coming into your mind, the words, 
the pictures, the sounds are things that in, are, are enlightening you or um, inspiring you. So I have a picture of a famous Indian. I have many pictures, but I have, I just put on a picture of Ananda Mai, who is a famous Indian saint who died in about 1982. And she was just one of the most loving beings in the planet. I think she woke up. I think she was born and enlightened. It was just this beautiful, beautiful being. And I don't read her work, but I just look at her picture and I think, yeah, that's good. And the heart's open. So quite often we don't actually have to do that much meditation to open the heart. We see a picture of someone we love and we just focus on that, not in any kind of crazy concentration, but just allow the goodness. So, so like here, I have Lompo Liam, Lompo Cha, we have the Buddha, just uh, Amar Siri here, you know. And, and I can look at, like I can look at a picture of Lung Pa Cha and let that image come to me and feel gratitude. That's meditation, isn't it? Uh, or Lung Pa Liam, I love him so much. I see him, I just feel happy seeing him. So you can introduce or even just use that in a way of uplifting the mind so that meditation isn't this kind of desire to control or get something or attain, but it can be very, very beautiful. Because we, you know, beauty is very important in meditation. This is mudita, to, to, to see the beauty of your own heart. And this, of course, is the bhakti practices of India, which my brother here has edified me a lot recently. But, you know, bhakti is the uplifting of the heart by looking at the beloved and feeling the qualities of the beloved. And what is the beloved? The Lumpacha is the beloved for me. And, 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 and Lumpacha and the Buddha, and uh, Ajahn Suchito, and Ajahn Amaro, I have all these people I love. And, and to actually just do that, and, and, and allow, allow the image to strike you, and just rest in the heart, is meditation. That's meditation. So that's quite often like the way you can introduce your practice with, with devotional practices. And that's what we're doing with the Reflections on the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. Sometimes those don't have as much heart in them as a picture. For me, at least, when I when I chant the Itipi So, it it doesn't create much heart for me. It's more like a mantric thing. I think for Venerable Siri, because he's fluent in in Sanskrit and Pali, for him he gets a much more heartfelt sense of the language. I don't have a skill of the language, so. I'm just as happy to begin my puja by looking at a picture of Lompo Sumedho. And what does that do for the mind? It brings the mind to a state of happiness. Right? It's not sensual happiness. Now, it's not the same as watching a, a really good movie. It's a different kind of happiness. It's the happiness of the Brahma Viharas. And these are so important in our spiritual life, so important, because they're love. They're the aspects of love. So if you begin with that, if you begin by looking at the picture of the beloved, whoever it might be in your life, and, and then open the heart from there. And then just say, I am, drop the am, drop the I, and know that you are awareness, awareness of change, and see what, see what that does. Well, you're not trying to get any experience. You are aware of all experience coming and going, coming and going. So this meditation, which I introduced, it was quite rigorous. I usually don't do such a full-on guided meditation i kind of really kept you on the on your body but somehow getting into the getting getting your, your mind composed into awareness and then taking awareness as your practice that's what i find most fruitful but you need something to collect and compose the mind so if you take that combination opening the heart with some chant some picture right then getting into the body settling into the body composing the mind and the body, and then realizing this is in awareness. There's an experience in awareness and be that awareness of change. So those are the kinds of things I'll, I'll, I'll be talking about. So I think I've done it. It's almost nine o'clock. <laughs> so have a good day or a good night. And we shall meet again in about 12 kind of roughly hours. Something like that, yeah? And I think we finished with a metta suit, is that right? Okay, let's chant that together. Please join us.
This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease, whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child. So with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating <coughs> kindness over the entire world spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, free from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding by not holding to fixed views. The pure hearted one having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. All right, everyone, be well. See you next time.